Parshas Korach has 95 verses and nine mitzvos, and it tells the story of Korach, who was Moshe and Aaron's first cousin. Their fathers were brothers, and he's going to launch a rebellion against Moses and against Aaron. Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kahas, the son of Levi, separated himself with Dasan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav, and On, the son of Peles, the offspring of Ruvain. The Parsha begins with Korach getting a, a group of co-conspirators with him to rebel against Moses. They stood before Moses with 250 men from the children of Israel, leaders of the assembly, though summoned for meeting, men of renown. So he collects a group of powerful, influential individuals, 250 unnamed people, plus Dathan and Aviram and On. So this is 254 people. And they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron, and they said to them, Is it too much for you? For the entire assembly, all of them are holy, and Hashem is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves over the congregation of Hashem? So this is the beginning of the saga of Korach's rebellion. Now Rashi here tells us that Korach, he took himself. The literal translation of the beginning of the Parsha is that Korach took himself, and Rashi gives us various interpretations of what that means either that he separated himself from the rest of the community, alternatively, that he cajoled the co-conspirators, this 253 other people, other men, to join him in his rebellion. Now, there's a very interesting Rashi here to begin the Parsha. It tells us that when Korach is attributed, he's the son of, of Yitzhar, the son of Kahas, the son of Levi, it does not go to the next generation to tell us that, that Levi was the son of Jacob. It stops short. Korach, Ben Yitzhar, Ben Kahas, Ben Levi, but not all the way back to Jacob. So why is he not attributed as the great, great grandson of Jacob? So Rashi tells us that when Jacob was on his deathbed and he was giving his last will and testament, his blessing to his children, he singled out Shimon and Levi and he didn't bless them. In fact, he cursed them. And he said that they behaved in an improper manner. They have stolen the craft of Esau when they attacked and destroyed the city of Shechem. And he ends off his reprimandation of Shemar Levi that when they gather together, when they congregate, don't mention my name. At the end of Jacob's life, he's praying that when they have a scheme against Moses and, and, and Aaron, i.e. in the rebellion of Korach, it should not attribute Korach to Jacob. That's what Rashi tells us. Now, there's a really interesting question. Shimon and Levi, when they were young teenagers, they had a scheme as well, and they destroyed the city of Shechem that had violated their sister Dina. And Jacob is telling Shimon and Levi on his deathbed that the behavior that you exhibited was not behavior that you got from me, it's behavior that you got from my brother Esav. But the obvious question is, what does the violence towards the residents of Shechem, what is the activities that Shimon and Levi did when they were behaving as if they were sons of Esav and not the sons of, of Jacob, what does that have to do with the rebellion of Korach? And I think there's a deep point over here. Korach is going to launch this rebellion, this mutiny, this insurrection against Moshe and Aaron. At the root of it all, and we'll see more about this in a little bit, the root of it all was envy. He was envious that he was not appointed to a position that he thought he was worthy of and was his legitimately by right. Envy is the same root of the behavior of Shimon and Levi. Shimon and Levi, Jacob tells him, you did not act with tools that were rightfully yours, you stole the craft of my brother Esav. When someone steals the craft of someone else, then in effect they're demonstrating that the Almighty did not give them what they need for their job, and therefore they have to take the craft of someone else. Shimon and Levi, they really came from Jacob. They should have been more gentle. They should not have had that same propensity, that same tendency towards violence. Yet they said, you know what, now we have to act like Esav to destroy the town. The same root lies in the rebellion of Korach. What does he do? He says, well, I was not given what I needed, and therefore I have to be envious of someone else. 
And thus Jacob says, you know what? When Korach's rebellion is going to be mentioned, don't attribute it to me. This does not come from me. This is an extension of Korach's great-grandfather's behavior, of Levi's behavior, when he too stole what did not belong to him. He too had that same characteristic. Now, who were these people who joined the rebellion? We have Dathan and Abiram. We met them already earlier. These are famous rabble-rousers. And On ben Peles from the tribe of Ruvain. Rashi tells us that the tribe of Ruvain was encamped near the family of Kahas, near the family of Korach. And says Rashi, woe to the wicked one, woe unto his neighbor. Because these people where they were encamped, it was next to each other. Therefore, Korach was a bad influence on his neighbors from the tribe of Ruvain. And therefore, the people that joined his rebellion, it's not a surprise that they come from the tribe of Ruvain. They had bad neighbors, and those bad neighbors influenced them to join the rebellion. In fact, the Talmud tells us that when you buy a house, more important than looking at the floor plan or the lot size or how many directions you get the airflow, the most important thing to look at is who are the neighbors. Because if you're in a bad neighborhood, if your neighbors are wicked, it's quite likely that their influence will rub off against you and you will suffer in the same way that they did. Now, Rashi gives us a little bit more of the backstory of why Korach was motivated to launch a rebellion and what he did about it. And it tells us that really he had no problem with Moses being the, in effect, the king, or with Aaron being the high priest, being the Kohen Gadol. He was envious when Elitzaphon ben Uziel, which is another cousin, Uziel is the brother of Yitzhar and the brother of Amram, that's the father of Korach and the father of Moses and Aaron, respectively. And Elitzaphon, he was appointed as the head of the house of Kehas. And Korach reasoned that, yes, Amram was the oldest brother, and therefore his two sons, appropriately, they got one got the kingdom, Moses, and one got the high priesthood. But the next office should be given to me. I'm the son of the second oldest brother of Kehas. And therefore, if you have another appointment to give out, it should go to me. And Elitzaphon is the son of Uziel, who is the youngest brother. And therefore, it was Korach's office. It was Korach's appointment by right. And therefore, this caused and this instigated this rebellion. Now, it is interesting that the initial beef that Korach had was with the appointment of the mutual cousin as the head of the family of Kahas with the appointment of Elitzaphon. But once he gets into the quarrel, he begins to question Moshe and begins to question Aaron. Why is Moshe the king? Why is Aaron the high priest? It's almost as if the initial envy had a compounding effect and it extended beyond the realm of the initial matter. Initially, all he wanted was to be the head of the tribe or the family of Kahas. But ultimately, once he got caught up in the flow of the argument and the quarrel and the dispute, he demanded more. And how did he actually go about doing his rebellions? Rashi tells us something very interesting. It's kind of an odd way that he mounted his insurrection. He gathered these 250 important men of distinction, the majority of them from the tribe of Ruvain, and he said to them, I want to get you all dressed up in garments that are entirely made of techelis wool. And he comes to Moses and he says to them, okay, see, look at these 250 people wearing garments entirely made out of techelis wool. Does this garment need tzitzis? We read in last week's parasha that when you wear a four-corner garment, you put tzitzis, you put fringes on it, and then around the tzitzis, you wrap one cord of techelis wool. But here, the entire garment is made out of techelis wool. Does such a garment, asks Korach, To Moses, does such a garment need tzitzis on it or not? So Moses responded, of course it does. Of course, why would this garment be any different? Of course, this garment needs to have tzitzis like any other garment. And Korach started laughing. I don't get it. If you have one strand, one cord of tcheles, that absolves the entire garment. That's enough. And here, if you have an entire garment, the whole garment is made of tcheles, all the more so it should be absolved. That's what the Rashi tells us. Now, the Midrash extends this a bit further. The Midrash tells us that Korah had an additional question. We know that on the doorpost of our homes, we put a mezuzah, which is a citation from the Torah, two paragraphs from the Torah. 
Korach asked Moses the following question. Suppose you have a home, the home is stockpiled with Torah scrolls. Does such a home need to have mezuzah on the doorpost? And of course, Moses tells him, yeah, of course, why would this house be any different? doesn't matter what the house contains. If there's a house, it needs to have a mezuzah. And again, they started laughing. I don't get it. If you have one tiny citation, two paragraphs in the Torah, and you put it in the door, that absolves the whole house. But if you stockpile Torah scroll upon Torah scroll in the whole house, it doesn't cover it, doesn't make any sense. And this was the argument that Korach uses to justify his claim that we don't need Moses, we don't need Aaron, the whole assembly, all of them, they're all holy. Why are you any better? Why is Moses and Aaron any better than us? Now, the obvious question is, what does a garment made entirely of treles and a house entirely full of Torah scrolls, what does that possibly have to do with Korach's claim that Moses and Aaron are illegitimate? So my grandfather, blessed memory, he explained a very deep and interesting idea. Korach, after all, he wasn't a dummy. He was actually very intelligent and he was very wise. And he was a great Torah scholar. The only thing was is that he had a certain envy. He had a certain desire for a post, for responsibility, for an office that was not given to him by God. And he developed an entire philosophy, an entire Weltanschauung about how the world works and how mitzvos work that he used that to create the argument as to why Moses and Aaron are unnecessary. Korach believed that mitzvos are there to absolve us from responsibility. And therefore, you have a, a, a garment. And on the garment, you put tzitzis. And on the tzitzis, you put one cord of techelis wool. And of course, the techelis has deep meanings. The techelis reminds you of God. And this absolves you. This is the minimum that you need to fulfill your requirement. However, in an ideal world, suppose you could have everything that you wanted. If there was no scarcity, then of course you should wear a garment that's entirely made out of trellis. Isn't that even better? It's just that it's very difficult. Trellis is very expensive and it's not reasonable. And therefore the Torah says, you know what? All you need is one stream that absolves you of any responsibility. Similarly, Ideally, what should be in your home? The home should be full of Torah scrolls. Isn't that the best thing to have in your home? Isn't that the best thing to store in your home? It's just that, you know, that's not practical. It's it's expensive. We have scarcity. And therefore, the Torah says, okay, just put, you know, the small citation, the mezuzah on the door. That's like in, in a suboptimal way. It's not possible to do it in the best way. And therefore, do it at the minimum. Absolve your responsibility by putting the mezuzah on, on your door. But in an ideal case, if you did have a house that's full of Torah scrolls, well, then indeed you wouldn't need to have the minimal requirement of putting the mezuzah on your door. Similarly, with a community, ideally you would have a nation that the whole nation is prophets. Everyone is a clergyman. Everyone is a leader. It's just that's not practical because after all, you know, people are busy and people don't have so much time and people have other responsibilities and people are fallible. And therefore, you have one leader, one clergyman to guide the nation. But in an idealized world, if everyone really was a clergyman, then you wouldn't need that one person to tower above them all. And that is Korah's argument. He tells Moses and Aaron, the entire assembly, all of them are holy, and Hashem is among them. Why do you exalt yourself over the congregation of Hashem? According to Korah, the nation is like a garment that's entirely made out of treles. It's like a house that's entirely replete with Torah scrolls. In that idealized world, you don't need to absolve yourself with the suboptimal way to have only one leader. The whole nation's holy. Everyone is a prophet. And therefore, Moses and Aaron, you are redundant. We don't need you. You're no better than us. A very interesting worldview that he had. And the argument is sound. It makes sense what he's saying. The only problem is it's against the Torah. And At its root, we know that it was really motivated by envy. Really, he was just simply envy, and he used the envy to create this whole edifice, this whole argument, this whole theorem, this whole philosophy that was just there to justify his claim that was really rooted in envy. I did hear another interesting idea about the house full of Torah scrolls. We know that... Internally, we have our internal self, and externally, we have the way we present ourselves to others. 
And it's important for us to not only cleanse ourselves internally, but to also, when we speak to other people, when we interact with other people, when we interface with other people, it should be done also in a way that is fitting who we are internally. And the Chassam Sofer, one of the giants of the 18th and 19th century, he says that even if someone internally is like an angel, i.e. like a house that's full of Torah scrolls, your mouth, which is the interface with the world around you, has to also be holy. You also have to put that mezuzah on the door, so to speak, on the door to your world, where you connect with the world around you, it also has to have a mezuzah. And we see with Korach, it's clear from all the commentaries that Korach was not a simple man. He was, of course, the first cousin of Moses, and he was a leader amongst the Jewish people. And he's, it seems like he had righteous intentions, at least up to a certain point. The problem was is that his mouth led him astray. His mouth was the way that he interacted with other people, and that is where he kind of got tripped up. And therefore, we see this idea in this Midrash that it's not enough to have a house that's full of Torah scrolls. You also have to have a mezuzah on the door to represent the way that you interact with the people. That also has to be righteous. Now, one more note here in the beginning of the Parsha. We meet uh, uh, one of the co-conspirators is Own, the son of Peles, and he appears only at the beginning of the narrative. Only in the initial phases of the rebellion is he present. However, at the end, it seems like he disappears from the story, and we're going to discuss his fate in a little bit. So it looks like we have a full-fledged rebellion, and Moshe responds. Moses heard, and he fell on his face. It's very interesting Rashi here in verse 4. That tells us that Moshe is only dejected because of what it portends to the people. This is a theme that we see throughout the Torah. When Rashi explains something that could be potentially ambiguous, you know, Moshe's own leadership, his own credentials are being questioned, and he seems to be dejected and disappointed, and you could say maybe cynically, that the reason why Moshe is falling on his face is because, oh no, he's going to lose his kingdom. And Rashi tells us, no, that the reason why Moshe was disappointed and dejected, he was terrified of what this would mean for the nation. How much more can he convince God, so to speak, to not retaliate against the people given their repeated offenses and their repeated misbehavior again and again they're questioning god and that's what he's really worried about and that's why he's falling on his face now it is very interesting that aaron does not fall on his face even though moses and aaron are both being attacked so to speak why is only moses falling on his face and not aaron there's a very interesting ramban here he tells us that aaron in his holiness in his ethical standing he did not say anything in response to Korach. He was quiet, he was silent, and he gave the impression as if he agrees that Korach is greater than him and that really Korach is deserving of what he is asking for and Aaron is only fulfilling his responsibilities, his duties as the high priest because he's listening to Moses and he's listening to God, but Korach's claim has validity. Aaron yielded to Korach's claim. And this, I think, shows us a little bit more about Aaron. Aaron is presented as the paragon of peace. The Mishnah tells us in Perker Avos, you should be from the students of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace. Aaron is always not only desirous of peace, but doing anything he can to pursue peace. And if it means to yield his own job to forfeit his own responsibility to give up being high priest in favor of Korach, that's what he will do. Only Moses falls on his face. Aaron doesn't. Aaron on his own is really willing to yield. What does Moses do? He spoke to Korach and to his entire assembly saying, in the morning, God will make known the one who is his own and the Holy One, and he will draw him close to himself. And whomever he will choose, he will draw close to himself. So what does Moses do here? He's going to tell them, okay, let's, let's, tomorrow we'll have a challenge. We'll have a showdown and God will decide indeed which is the one that's close, which is the one that's supposed to be the high priest. Is it you or is it Aaron? So first of all, 
we see that Moshe is intervening, so to speak. He's trying to prevent a full-blown insurrection to prevent the consequences of what that would entail. And he presents a challenge for them. Now, what is the challenge? Do this, he tells them, verse 6. Take for yourself fire pants, korach, your entire assembly, put fire in them, put incense in them, and offer them to God tomorrow. And the man who Hashem will choose, he is the Holy One. So he tells them, okay, we'll have you and Aaron. Both of you will, will do an incense offering. And we'll see whichever one God accepts. And whichever one God accepts, we know that's the one that God indeed is desirous of. He is the high priest. Now, this is a very interesting challenge because back in Leviticus, we read how Aaron's two sons, the Davin of Viu, they died when they brought an improper incense offering. And therefore, what Moshe is telling them here, he's trying to steer them off. He's trying to say, be careful what you ask for, be careful what you wish for, because you remember what happened to Nadav and Aviyah when they brought an incense offering that wasn't proper. They died, and Moshe hoped that this would be enough to bring Korach back to his senses and to allow cooler heads to prevail and to quiet, to quell the rebellion. Also, he tells them, let's do it tomorrow. Why not right now? If there is a rebellion, if there's a mutiny, isn't it best to squash it before it gets out of, out of hand? And again, Rashi tells us, that this is also a ploy. Moshe is trying to save them. He's trying to let, let, let them sleep over it, let them make sure that they really want this, because if they go ahead and contest Aaron and, in effect, contest Moses and, in effect, contest God, then it's not going to end up well for them. And therefore, sleep on it, come back tomorrow, and we'll see what will will happen. Hopefully, you'll reconsider and we won't have to suffer as a result of, of this rebellion. Now Rashi tells us here in verse 7 something interesting. He tells us that Korah really was a wise person. But why is he acting so foolishly? And it tells us that Korah, he was a prophet, and his prophecy, his vision, actually led to his downfall. Because he saw his lineage, he saw great descendants that were going to come out of his offspring, namely Samuel, Shmuel, who was equal in some ways to Moses and to Aaron. And therefore he said, okay, it seems like I'm going to have a very bright destiny, a very, very bright future. I'm going to have all these righteous descendants, and therefore all this greatness is going to come out of me, and I'm not going to obviously die. I'm going to have continuity. I'm going to be saved. But the truth is that his children were saved, but he himself went down very severely in a very miserable fashion. So Moses says to Korach, hear hear now, O offspring of Levi. In Hebrew, this reads that Moshe is speaking to very pleasantly. Again, we see Moses trying to intervene to circumvent, to curb the insurrection, to appease them. Is it not enough for you that the God of Israel segregated you from the assembly of Israel to draw you, draw you near to himself? After all, you're a Levite. You perform a service in the tabernacle. You stand before the assembly to minister to them. You do have something. Why do you need to ask for everything? He's reminding them that you do have a unique distinction. God did elevate you above the entire populace. He drew you near and all your brethren, the offspring of Levi, with you. Yet you seek priesthood as well. Why are you asking for everything, don't you realize how much you already have? You're going to forfeit that. You're going to lose that if you go ahead with this. Therefore, you and your entire assembly that are joined with you are against Hashem. And for Aaron, what is he that you protest against him? And again, Moses is constantly trying to stem, to curb this dispute. And he's going to take action. He's going to actively try to stifle the dispute and try to resolve it amicably. Moses sent forth to summon Dathan and Abiram. These are the other participants in the dispute. He says, okay, let's talk. Let's resolve this. Let, let's stop the rebellion. Let's end the division. But they said, we shall not go up. You took us out of the land of milk and honey. You took us out of the land of Egypt. We're going to die in the wilderness. You seek to dominate us yet further. You promised to bring us to the land of Canaan, the land flowing of milk and honey. But we have nothing. Even if you would gouge out the eyes of those men, we shall not go up. There's nothing that you can do 
that would make us have a dialogue with you that would prompt us to end this dispute. Rashi tells us that there was a a haunting truth in their words. They said to Moses, we will not ascend. And the truth is that their words were correct. They went only down, downhill from there on out. So Moses is trying to remedy, to reconcile, and he has no one who wants to bite, no one wants to participate. This distressed Moses greatly, and he said to Hashem, don't turn to their gift offering. I have not taken even a single donkey of theirs, nor have I wronged even one of them. So Moses now begins to pray to Hashem, to the Almighty, that the Almighty should not accept their offering, should accept instead Aaron's offering, and to show all that indeed Moshe was acting in accordance with the instruction of God. There's a very interesting Ramban here. The Ramban translates the word minchasam, their gift offering, as their prayer, as if Moses is telling God, don't accept their prayers. And you would imagine that their prayer would be inefficacious. After all, these people are questioning Moses, they're questioning Aaron, they're causing division, dispute, discord amongst the nation. And yet Moses is worried that their prayer may work. And therefore he has to neutralize their prayer with the prayer of his own. This, I think, tells us the power of prayer, the extent of prayer. Even someone like Korach, who's starting up with Moses, the greatest man that ever lived, his prayer could have potentially brought him victory in the showdown with Aaron. We read in prayer, in the liturgy, Karov Hashem Lechol Korav, God is close to all those who call him, provided they call him with sincerity, with being genuine. Even if someone is a sinner, even if someone is wicked, even someone as wicked as Korach, who's causing all kinds of disunion amongst the people, if they call to God, their prayer can be listened to. The Talmud talks about a thief amidst his robbery praying, and that is still a legitimate prayer, because it doesn't matter who someone is in aggregate, when they call out to God, God listens, and therefore Moses has to pray that their prayer not be accepted. And we see also an addition over here in verse 15, a theme that we saw at the end of Exodus, that Moses is fastidious with public money. I didn't take even a single donkey for them. Rashi tells us this refers to when Moses went down to Egypt to save the Jewish people. His transportation, he provided for himself. You would think, you know, if he's going to save the nation, they should provide him with the donkey. But no, he took it for himself. And that shows that he is the, the paragon of a righteous, of a honorable leader, and therefore that's part of Moses' prayer to justify his, his request that Korach not win. And Moses again reiterates to Korach the terms of, of this showdown, bring the fire pan, bring the incense, Aaron with, with uh, his fire pan on one side, you with all your co-conspirators on the other side, and indeed, the following day, they did that. Each man took his fire pan, they placed a fire upon it, put incense on it, and they stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron and Korach and his assembly, and everyone's gathered there at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of Hashem appears to the entire assembly. Now, why is the entire assembly there? Rashi tells us that Korach, like a populist demagogue, managed to rile up the masses against Moses and Aaron. You would think that whole night he was praying, he was trying to find favor, to find merit in his own righteousness. But no, that whole night what he was doing is making the rounds, going to every one of the tribes and trying to have them join his rebellion. And he tells them, do you think I'm doing this for myself? I'm just trying to get my own honor? No, I am starting this campaign against Moses for all of you. They took all the goodness that really belongs to you. This is electioneering 101. When you really want something, but you convince the masses that really it's in their best interest to support you, and indeed the whole assembly is there, and many of them have a leaning towards Korach against Moses and Aaron. And God is now arriving so to speak, that glory of Hashem appears amidst this showdown. And Hashem tells Moses and Aaron, separate yourself from 
the assembly. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to get rid of these rebels. And they start praying and they tell God, God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, i.e. Korach, and you're going to be angry with with everyone? It does. It's not fair to destroy everyone because of the sin of, of one person. Now, there's a very interesting Ramban here, and he begins a theme that's going to be strung out throughout the whole Parsha. He says, I don't get it. If the Jewish people did not sin, none of them rebelled against Moses, then why indeed did God say I'm going to destroy the whole, the whole nation, the whole assembly? And if they did sin, if they're all guilty as Korach is in this rebellion, what is the claim of Moses and Aaron one person sinned and you're angry with everyone? No, it's not just one person that sinned. It's everyone that sinned. So it doesn't seem to really fit. If God is going to accuse all of them of being rebels, how does Moses and Aaron say, no, it's really only one person that is the rebel? And the Ramban says something very interesting here. He says that what Korach, his appeal to the masses was that if you remember a few weeks ago, the Levites, they took their responsibility away from the firstborn. And therefore, the whole nation, every family had their own firstborn, who was supposed to be like part of the Levites, the clergymen. And now they all lost that responsibility. And Korach came to the masses, to all the tribes, and says, okay, I'm going to restore the role of the firstborn. I'm going to take that back away from the Levites. And therefore, the people said, okay, well, that sounds like a pretty good offer. I'd love to have my big brother. I'd love to have someone from our tribe to be one of the clergymen. And therefore, that's why they joined. And therefore, God says, okay, it seems like they're all guilty. I'm going to destroy them all in an instant. But Moses and Aaron, they said no. They found favor. They found merit. They found justification and vindication because truthfully, it's only Korach who is the instigator. He's the one who is seducing the nation. And therefore, because he's the instigator, he's really the only one that is kickstarting this rebellion. He should be the only one that is put down, that's punished. And that is a way to actually teach the nation that really it's Korach who was the problem, not everyone else. If he's singled out, then maybe the lesson will be learned not to follow the next Korach that may come down the pipeline. A very interesting dialogue over here that we see in verse 21 and 22 between God and Moses and Aaron and how the Ramban explains what was Korach's cell to the people. The cell was that the role of the firstborn, it was unfairly usurped from the Levites, and I'm going to re- restore that, but truthfully that was done per the instruction of God, and therefore Korach was wrong. So even now, the two sides are, so to speak, facing each other. And still, Moshe has a relentless effort of trying to appease and trying to reconcile a last-ditch effort at peace. Moses stood up and went to Dathan and Aviram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And Rashi tells us that he was trying to reconcile, he was trying to appease them, he was trying to find some way to resolve this before everyone is going to have to suffer. And indeed, the Mishnah tells us that there's two kinds of disputes, of arguments. There's one of them that are done for the sake of heaven, which is epitomized by the arguments of Hillel and Shammai. And there's a second kind of argument that's not done for the sake of heaven, and that is the argument of Korach and his group and his minions and his cohorts. But it doesn't list as if there was an argument between Korach and Moses. You read the, 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 the description over here in the parsha. it seems like Korach is the opposite of Moses. They're the ones who are the disputants. Yet the way the Mishnah describes it is that it's Korach and his cohorts. That's the epitome of a machlokas, of a dispute that's not done for altruistic reasons for the sake of heaven. And what this tells us is that this is really a one-sided dispute. Moses was not an equal participant in this dispute, Moses was not a participant at all. He was not trying to argue, to fight, to disagree with them. He was constantly, until the very end, trying to intervene, trying to forestall this dispute, trying to end it in in an amicable way. But they don't listen, they don't bite. So he speaks to the assembly, turn away from the tents of these wicked people, don't touch anything that belongs to them, 
because they're going to perish because of their sins. Anyone that cleaves to them will perish likewise. So they got themselves up from either the dwelling of Korach, of Dathan, and Abiram from all around. Dathan and Abiram went out erect at their entrance of the tents, their wives, their children, and their infants. Rashi tells us, come and see how dangerous and how terrible and how destructive disagreements and disputes are because, you know, the heavenly court only punishes once someone reaches the age of 20 and here even young suckling infants are going to be punished in the sin of Korach and his rebellion. It's a very interesting and sad idea that when there is dispute, when then there's when there's disagreement, when there's discord, when there's disharmony, disunity, it's a conflagration that consumes all anyone who who's participating in this is going to suffer. Even people as young as suckling infants are going to be found guilty, so to speak. And the reason for this is, very deep idea, the Maharal tells us that the only way for disagreements and disputes and disunity to flourish is if people are not willing to be at all flexible. If someone is flexible enough, willing to give in, well, then they're never going to have these lasting disagreements because they'll yield, they'll forfeit, they'll give in. However, someone who stands by the strict letter of the law is someone that says, I'm not willing to give in at all. And therefore, in such a person, disagreements and machlokes can flourish. And therefore, says the Maharal, that really the reason why children are absolved from any punishment is because judgment doesn't apply to them. But when someone is so mortally bound by judgment, not willing to yield an inch... They're not willing to remove themselves from judgment at all. Judgment cleaves to them and even their children. Normally, children are free of judgment. But because they cleave to judgment, judgment cleaves to them. And therefore, their children too are swept away. Very scary idea that shows us really how dangerous, how destructive this kind of disagreement is. And Moses makes an announcement here to the people. Through this you shall know that Hashem sent me to perform all these acts. I did not do these myself. I didn't appoint myself as the king. I didn't appoint Aaron as the high priest. I didn't appoint Elit Safon ben Uziel as the head of the family of Kaz. This was not done by myself. And I'll prove it to you. If these die, like the death of all men, and the destiny of all men is visited upon them, then it is not Hashem what's I mean, if the people here, the 250 some odd men, that are participants of this rebellion of Korach, if they die a normal, natural death, you know that I'm a fraud. But if Hashem will create a phenomenon and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them and all that is theirs, and they descend alive into the pit, you should know that these men have provoked God. And indeed, when he finished speaking these words, the ground that was under them split open, the earth opened its mouth, it swallowed them and their households and all the people that were with Korach and all their wealth. They and all that was theirs descended alive to the pit. The earth covered them over and they were lost from among the congregation. All of Israel's around them fled at the sound. They said, oh no, lest the earth swallow us up. And then a flame descended forth from Hashem and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. The Mishnah tells us that this mouth of the earth is one of the ten things that were created at the twilight between Friday and Shabbos of the six days of creation. It's a hybrid of the spiritual and physical. It's like a sinkhole, but not a regular physical one. It's also a spiritual one. The earth has a mouth that opened and it, it shut. It's a new creation that was never seen before. And indeed, once it opened and swallowed them, they couldn't even find where the crevice was, the Ramban here explains that the, that the earth snapped them up instantly. It's almost like it was if the mouth opened and snatched them and it closed shut and they were lost forever. No one knew where they were. And that's the meaning behind the verse 33. They were lost from among the congregation. In addition, the Talmud tells us what, it, what does it mean that they were lost from among the congregation? It means that they don't merit a share in, in Olam Abba. Normally, people are punished and once they're punished in this world, then their eternal merit in Olam is undiminished. But here, these people, not only were they destroyed in this world, they were covered over, they were 
kind of descended alive, they're buried alive by the earth's mouth, but they also are eternally damned. They don't have a portion in Olam Haba. Now, there is an interesting epilogue to the story that the Talmud tells us of one of the great sages who met an Arab Bedouin who showed him the crevice where Korach's rebellion was buried, kind of the, the lips of the earth that swallowed them. And he put his ear down, the great sage did, and he listened in, and this, even, even though it's a thousand years later, the Talmud tells us, the book of Central, page 110a, that he was able to hear the voices, so to speak, of Korach's rebellion a thousand years later. What were they saying? Moshe MS, Vitorasso MS, Vehem Badain. Moses is true, his Torah is true, and they, which is a reference to themselves, they are liars. Now, Korach's children did not die. We actually read that a verse later on in, in Numbers 26, 11. They did not die. They repented at the last moment, and they were spared. Now, there is another individual that is only mentioned at the beginning, but at the end, and that's On Ben Pelas. What happened to him? So the Talmud tells us that his wife saved him. Why? Initially, he had joined the rebellion, like Korach and the 250 other men, and uh, Dathan and Abiram. But his wife she gave him some sound advice. She says to him, okay, what do we have now? Moses is the king, Aaron is the high priest, and Korach doesn't like it. He wants to be king. He wants to be high priest. Why do you need to get involved? Regardless, if he's the king, you're a peasant. If he's the king, you're a peasant. You have nothing to gain from this dispute. It's better to just avoid it. And he said to his wife, but that's that's all fine and dandy, but I promised them that I'm going to join them when they have the rebellion. In the morning, we're going to have the showdown with the incense. I, I can't come back on my word. I have to maintain my dignity. I have to join them. And she says, you know what? I have a solution. She gives him some wine. She puts him to sleep. And she uncovered her hair. And she sat at the entrance of the tent. And when they wanted to wake him up for... The rebellion for the showdown, they walked into the tent. They saw his wife. She wasn't dressed in a modest way. Her hair was uncovered, and they noped out of there. And therefore, by the time he woke up from his stupor, all of Korach and his co-conspirators, his cohorts, were already dead. And the Talmud concludes that this is a fulfillment of the wisdom of women builds homes. Who is that reference to? That's a reference to Own Ben Pelas' wife. She saved him. That's the story that we read about Own Ben Pelas and how he participated in it initially, but ultimately was saved thanks to the wisdom of his wife. But there's, I think, an obvious question. You know, his wife's argument, what do you have to gain? That was true at the beginning. And the question is, what was his motivation to join the rebellion in the first place? Why did Owen Ben Pelis initially join the rebellion and only when his wife said he had nothing to gain, only then did he rescind his participation? He had nothing to gain at the very beginning as well. And I think what this tells us, a very deep idea about the nature of, of strife. It's somewhat appealing. It's attractive even if you don't have a horse in the race, the idea of the opposition, the idea of joining the tribe that is the herd, so to speak, the rabble rousers, to be part of the breakaway, there's a certain thrill to it of joining the mob that is in opposition to the establishment. Even if you have nothing to gain, there's something about being part of a tribe, being part being partisan, so to speak, joining the resistance, joining the rebellion, and not really thinking through the cost-benefit analysis. Just saying, I want to join the rebellion, and I'm not really thinking much past that. It's just a desire to be contrarian, to rebel. There's something appealing about that fight, even if you have nothing to gain. I had an interesting thought. There is an uh, informal word in English, to own someone which means to like, according to Google, means to utterly defeat an opponent or a rival, to completely get the better of them. I was thinking maybe this individual, Own Ben Pelas, he's the origin of that term, you know, to own someone, which really means you have nothing to gain. It's just something that you, you want to participate in the fight, 
regardless of whether or not you gain something. I think maybe this is a good lesson in today's volatile political landscape. People kind of develop their tribe and their, their partisan affiliation and they want the other side to lose even if it doesn't mean that they gain anything. They want to own them. And the truth is, you know, like own Ben Pellis's wife told him, what do you really have to gain? If this candidate wins, if this candidate wins, and we see, we know that uh, politics and things of the like, it tears apart families and it's really sad because people are motivated by the fight. They want to own the opposition even if they really have nothing to gain. And maybe we should follow the advice of Owen's wife, think about what we have to gain before we join any resistance, before we join any insurrection, any mutiny. Now, the protest, you would think, would be over. Korach is gone, the 250 co-conspirators are gone, Dathan and Abiram are gone, and you would think that this the story would be over, but it really isn't. So first of all, in chapter 17, we read that Moshe is told by God to go collect those fire pens because those fire pens became holy. The fire pens, i.e. of the 250 men of Korach and make them into sheets of, of copper and plate them as a covering of the altar to remind everyone that only the offspring of Aaron are legitimate Kohanim or legitimate priests to take the lesson of Korach and to literally etch it onto the altar that people don't make the same mistake again. In verse 5 we read, As a reminder to the children of Israel, so that no alien who is not of the offspring of Aaron shall draw near to bring up the smoke of incense before Hashem, that he not be like Korach and his assembly as Hashem spoke about him through Moses. This this last line here, to not be like Korach and his assembly, it's actually a mitzvah that we find in the Torah that there's a prohibition to behave like Korach and his assembly to make a dispute, to make a division, and sometimes, even if you're right, to yield and to not maintain, to not perpetuate these kinds of disagreements. There is a line made famous by Rabbi Israel Salanter. He said that the most dangerous kind of enemy is someone who believes that they're behaving per the instruction of God. When someone believes that they have the religious zeal and the religious legitimacy to do what they're doing, they can behave in terrible ways. And he used to say, based upon the Mishnah in Perkei Avos, that if there is a dispute for the sake of heaven, it's going to have continuity. If someone wants to argue, wants to make a dispute, wants to make a discord, and they believe that it's for the sake of heaven, then no matter what happens, they're going to be convinced that they're right and they're going to perpetuate it. They're going to have this argument to have continuity because people believe that this is done for the sake of heaven. And you would argue that Korach probably believed that he was doing the right thing. He was stopping the overreach of Moses and Aaron, and that was done for the sake of heaven. He thought it was done for the sake of heaven, but truthfully, it was not done for the sake of heaven, but therefore he didn't yield, he didn't give in, because he thought he was acting in a way that was uh, religiously sanctioned. So these fire pans are made as covers for the altar, and in verse 6 we read, the entire assembly of the children of Israel complained the next day, against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, you have killed the people of Hashem. Even though the people died were guilty of of insurrection, of rebellion, but the nation, the assembly, they say to Moses and Aaron, no, you killed the people of Hashem. And all the commentators are trying to figure out, you know, we saw a miracle once in history, a miracle, the land opening its mouth and swallowing them up. Obviously, Moses and Aaron were not acting on their own. So what's the complaint now? So the Rabban, he tells us, and again, this fits in nicely with how he understands Korach's cell to the other tribes. He told them that I'm going to make you the Levites like you were previously before you were demoted, before the firstborn were demoted. And here, what did Moses do? Moses had a, sh- uh, had a showdown between Korach and the priests and, and Aaron. And therefore, they felt, and the nation felt, the assembly felt, that this was the wrong challenge. Their challenge was not against Aaron and the priests, but against the Levites. And therefore, they felt that Aaron's proof, so to speak, where he triumphed over Korach, was not really addressing 
their claim, their claim was not against Aaron, but against the Levites. And that's why the next thing that's going to happen is going to be proving that the tribe of Levite in its entirety is the tribe of the clergy, is the tribe that is Hashem, so to speak. And that's the next proof to kind of quiet the next complaint. But before that happens, a plague erupts and begins to attack the nation. And Aaron is told by Moses, take a fire pan, bring incense, and go stop this plague from destroying the nation. And he quickly follows Moses' instruction. He grabs the fire pan and puts the incense on it, and he stands between the dead and the living, and the plague ceased. But before it could be stopped, there were 14,700 dead people that had died in the aftermath of the affair of, of Korach. So really interesting what happened over here. Rashi tells us there's a plague that, that erupts here. The people are not willing to absorb the lesson of Korach's downfall. They're still complaining, and that's why the plague happens. But the intervention of Moses is specifically via the incense. Rashi tells us that when Moses was in heaven to get the Torah, he was given a secret by the angels. They told him that the Ketoras, the incense, it has the power to stop plagues. And therefore he knew that information quickly sent Aaron with the incense to stop the plague. A second reason why the Ketoras, the incense, stopped the plague, Rashi also tells us, it's because the people... When they saw Korach and his collaborators, when he saw when they saw them dying as a result of this Ketoras incense showdown, they said, this Ketoras, this incense, it's poisonous, it's dangerous. After all, Nadav and Avihu died, and here, here we see the 250 men plus Korach and his co-conspirators are dying as a result of this as well. And therefore God says, oh, you think it's dangerous? Watch, you'll see it actually saves you, it will stop the plague. Rashi also tells us there's an interesting dialogue here between Aaron and the angel of death. The angel of death here is sent by God to go on a rampage against the nation to have a plague, and then Moses sends Aaron with the incense to to stop it. And the angel of death tells Aaron, let me go, I'm being sent by God. And Aaron tells the angel of death, no, 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 I'm being sent by Moses, I have to stop you. And just an interesting dialogue here. And ultimately, Aaron said to the angel of death, he says, well, Moses doesn't act on his own. He's acting per the instruction of God. And they went to Moses and indeed the plague stopped. But again, the people still are questioning the supremacy of the Levites. And therefore, one more great miracle is going to dispel that notion forever. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, to be the children of Israel, take from them one staff for each father's house from all their leaders according to the father's house 12 staffs each man's name shall you inscribe on the staff and the name of Aaron shall you inscribe on the staff of Levi we're going to have 12 staffs on each one of the staffs it's going to be inscribed the name of one of the tribes and we're going to place them in the tent of meeting it's going to be put next to the ark and God will choose which one of these tribes are his and that respective staff is going to Blossom, And the Mitras tells us that Moshe took a single tree, he split it into 12 pieces, and each one of those pieces was made into a staff for each one of the tribes. So no one should claim, well, oh, Aaron has a special staff that sprouted. In addition, we read in verse 21 that Aaron's staff was placed among them. It wasn't put any closer to the ark. So people should not claim that there's an impropriety if Aaron's staff, i.e. the staff that has the tribe of Levi inscribed upon it, it tipped the scale, it was unfairly selected by God. And indeed, the next day they took out the staffs and behold, the staff of Aaron of the house of Levi had blossomed. It brought forth a blossom, it sprouted a bud and almonds, ripened. Moses brought out all the staffs from before Hashem to the children of Israel they saw and they took each man his staff. And God told Moses, okay, this staff, the staff of Aaron, the staff that provides testimony to the fact that the tribe of Levi is indeed the one selected by God, place it for eternity in front of the ark of the testimony in, in the Holy of Holies. That way it should be a sign against the rebellious ones that they should not rebel any more. And indeed, 
this staff. It was held outside the ark along with the vial of manna, along with the anointing oil. And in fact, when the ark was hidden at the end of the first temple era, it was hidden along with the vial of manna, along with the anointing oil, and along with the staff of Aaron that had blossomed into almonds. Once it became clear to everyone that the domain of the tabernacle is only for Aaron and the Kohanim and the priests and Le- and the tribe of Levi, the children of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we will perish, we are all lost, we're all going to die, we're all going to die because we got too close to the tabernacle and to its work, we're going to die. And therefore, God told Aaron, you're responsible to prevent that, and therefore you have to guard the ark and, of course, the the tabernacle and all its vessels to make sure that people don't get too close, people don't get burned. In fact, there's a myth in the Torah that the Levites and the Kohanim, they have to station guards around the tabernacle, around the temple, to make sure that people don't get too close. In fact, at all times, there were 24 people who were watching the tabernacle, three Kohanim, three priests, and 21 Levites. And in fact, they had one person making rounds and making sure that all the guards were awake. And if they were sleeping, they would hit them on the head. You can't sleep when you're stationed to guard the tabernacle and the temple. And now the Parsha is going to end by listing all the various benefits of the priesthood and of the Levites. And Rashi tells us that the backstory of this is Aaron, of course, he was selected by God to be the Kohen, to be the priest, but people raise doubts upon that and therefore God says, okay, I want to enshrine for eternity the responsibilities and the benefits that you get as a Kohen. And it lists over here the 24 distinct gifts that are given to the Kohen. Ten of them are limited to the temple and the tabernacle, four of them in in Jerusalem, and ten of them in the borders of the land of Israel. Today, most of them we don't fulfill because we don't have a temple, but there are some of them that we still fulfill today, like, for example, the Pidyon Haben, the redeeming of firstborn males. Every firstborn male still has the holiness, the potential holiness of being part of the clergy, and therefore they're almost as if they're owned by the Kohen. And therefore, if someone has a firstborn son, they have to buy that son back from the Kohen, and that process and that ritual is still observed today. So the Torah lists all the various benefits that are given to the Kohen, but of course they lose something. In verse 20 we read, Hashem said to Aaron, in their land you shall have no heritage, and a share you should not have amongst them. I am your share in your heritage among the children of Israel. You don't get land, you don't get spoils of war, but you get these 24 gifts that are enumerated over here. And then it lists what the Levites get. The Levites get the tithings, but they also have to tithe their tithings, and they too do not get a portion in the land of Israel. But again, the Parsha concludes with it reiterating the roles of the Levites and of the Kohanim and the benefits that they get. Thank you all for listening. Again, the email address is rabbiwobachima.com and look forward to talking to you next week.